All right, good morning. Uh, we're going to start the program of today. Welcome to the uh, session on neuroscience uh, breakthroughs. Um, my name is uh, Cyril Pennard. I'm going to chair the session and um, let's see how this works. If we can have the next slide, please. Um, the mouse. Oh, yeah. Yeah, sure. Um, Pleased to announce uh, um, five speakers today. Um, I will introduce them uh, one by one, but uh, our first speaker will be uh, Svenja Kaspers, who joins us online. Um, and it's uh, a pleasure to, uh, to have her here. Uh, the session aims to give a sort of bird's eye view of, uh, of course, neuroscience breakthroughs, but especially focusing on brain networks, brain states, dynamics, and high-level function. Uh, so this represents not, of course, all of HPP neuroscience, but a slice of it that um, cuts through the various disciplines. And um, Svenja Kaspers is um, connected to Heinrich Heine University in Dusseldorf, uh, as well as the Forschungszentrum in, in Jülich. And she is uh, very well known in the field of human brain anatomy, uh, aging, uh, population imaging, and has also recently been applying uh, the virtual brain uh, in her work. So if all goes well, we can now switch to uh, the remote presence of Svenja. Let's see if this works. Uh -huh. <laughs> what was the question? And now... He should be appearing. <laughs> hmm? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Svenja, can you hear us? Yes. Good morning. All right. Good morning. Please go ahead. Yeah. Thank you very much for the introduction and thanks to the organizers for allowing me to um, join here remotely since unfortunately I could not come personally. It is my pleasure to start off this session with a bit of an overview of how population neuroimaging might be used nowadays to develop whole brain models further towards individual predictions. Talking about population neuroimaging, we are referring to very large cohorts of subjects, meaning hundreds to nowadays up to 10,000 of subjects actually, um, for whom we have a lot of data, not only for the brain, typically with MR imaging, but also on their phenotypical data from the outside world and from their health status. And the interesting thing is that now you can nicely investigate the variability of the human brain in relation to all these different types of factors that you see here. And just to mention a few, uh, prob probably most of you know them already, on the right side you do see some of the, the larger cohorts or initiatives all around the world and probably the most famous ones on the bottom, the UK Biobank from the UK, where we have uh, nowadays several ten thousands of subjects available. And um, I would now like to show you a little bit of um, these types of studies and to try to link that to the modeling aspect in the end. And one aspect that I would like to focus on is, as Cyril was already mentioning, the network aspect, and particularly the question how connectivity, the different types of connectivity that we know about, particularly structural and functional connectivity, relate to each other. And unfortunately, there is a lot of variability in the connectivity, as we all know, and particularly just linking structural connectivity here on the y-axis and functional connectivity here on the x-axis is not that easy. It's basically no cor direct correlation at all if you take a look at this slide here. And the question is, why is that so? And particularly as we age, we found out that just doing a quick correlation between structure and functional connectivity does not tell the whole story. But we did one study based on our 1000 brains cohort from the research center in Jülich, where we just decompose the different connectivity patterns that you find in particularly aged subjects, as particularly in aging, the uh, inter-individual variability is quite pronounced. And what you do see here is the first component, and there will be two others coming up in a second. And you do always see here on the first part, the structural connectivity on the top, and on the second, on the bottom, the functional connectivity. 
and you can see the change over age of these different types of connectivity on the left side always within a hemisphere and on the right side always across the hemispheres. And in this very first component, we do see a type of pattern of structural and functional connectivity where we do see quite some decrease of connectivity all across the brain, within the hemisphere, as well as across the hemispheres, and particularly pronounced structurally in the frontal lobe, functionally more so in the primary networks here around the uh, central region and around um, the occipital cortex. But not focusing on specific regions, just showing you now the second component that we could extract, you do see a totally different pattern. So there are patterns in this cohort of about a few hundred subjects where you do not only have people with this type of combination of structure and functional connectivity, but also this one here in the middle where you do see in the structure connectivity mainly a stable state, not really a large decrease or a large increase or anything else. But on the functional side, you do see quite some pronounced um, conservation or particularly maybe also a bit of increase in functional connectivity in maybe reaction to or at least correlated to the more or less stable or slightly declined um, structural connectivity. And as the third component, a totally different pattern again where you do see the opposite, quite some stable or maybe some increased structural connectivity Let's call it stable here as we talk about aging. And on the other side, pronounced decreases in functional connectivity. So there is a lot going on in there. And the question is, how can we make use of these types of information that we now have about the brain um, to further investigate if structural or functional connectivity are more um, relevant or more informative in understanding particularly the aged brain as one example, but you could name others as well. And just showing you two examples of how this is typically used nowadays when we talk about predictions or the ability to go from the brain phenotype to anything individualized, patient-wise or subject-wise where you would like to understand from the brain how a person ages or how the cognition changes. And here you do see an example from the UK Biobank where they investigated how structural connectivity can be used to predict age on the left side as one example and a general cognitive score, general cognitive function here on the right side. And what you do see here is the structural connections all over the brain. In the middle you do see the connections in a very abstract manner and all the red ones are increases, all the blue ones are decreases and the most prominent ones you do see here are those who are predictive for age or on the other hand cognition. It's not important to understand each single connection here, but do see the general pattern. You do have definitely different connections which are relevant for predicting age as compared to cognition. But the most interesting thing is here that even within the structural connectivity, where you can extract different types of parameters, which you see here in, as labeled by weights, you can extract something like the fractional anisotropy, a typical measure that we know from a lot of studies, mean diffusivity, or here in this case, the structural connectivity itself, meaning the streamline counts that you have. So just counting how many um, streamlines arrive from region A to region B, and then some other more higher level um, microstructural features. And the interesting thing is that all across different types of analysis um, approaches that uh, the colleagues here took, the streamline counts, so the basic connection strength, so to say, was the most predictive score that could be used for using structural connectivity for predicting age and cognition. So it's not that easy to just use structural connectivity at all, but if so, then maybe the streamline count could be helpful. Unfortunately, if we go to functional connectivity and trying to predict things using machine learning as in the last approach, the things get worse. And what you do see here is a study from our group. We're focusing again on the aging brain. And you do see here just across different types of um, sample sizes, different types of analysis approaches, that whatever you do using different types of machine learning approaches here on the x-axis, you never get anything much better in predicting cognition from functional connectivity data, anything much better than chance level. Depending on, on which studies you look, from younger to older subjects or mainly focusing on younger subjects, it is a bit better. But overall, predicting cognition from functional connectivity is not that easy. 
So the question is, can we do a bit better? And what we did over the last couple of years, um, particularly here in the Human Brain Project, together with the group of Victor Gilza from Marseille, we tried to take another approach in uh, understanding how connectivity might be related to anything like cognition or um, any phenotypical data. And we started off with using a modeling approach based on the virtual brain. And we started with the empirical data that we have from the cohorts. And one typical thing I already showed you in uh, the first slides is that we do see some decline of structural connectivity. So we started with a structure and now we wanted to use this information within the virtual brain to manipulate the virtual brain construct, the model, to output some functional connectivity data based on this manipulation on the left side. So decreasing the structural connectivity and seeing what the model does in terms of the functional connectivity side. And one interesting uh, parameter that you I'm really sorry. I hope you can hear me now again. And I will start, yeah, to share my screen again. I'm really sorry, but my connection broke down. I hope you can now see me and hear me again. Um, I just wanted to explain that we use the virtual brain to output some functional data based on the manipulation on the left side, on the structural connectivity. And the output that we investigated was the so-called G factor or G point, an optimal network coupling of um, the whole network brain, assuming that there is always an optimal point in a network where it works best. And we asked the question if we now can investigate if this optimal, optimal coupling point changes over age based on our modeling approach. And what we saw is that indeed we could, with two different approaches, per subject, so on an individual basis, demonstrate that in the empirical data on the top here, as well as in this virtually aged situation of the virtual brain model, we do see that this optimal network state shifts towards higher values. So the subjects age, and as we age, this optimal network coupling point shifts towards higher values, meaning that there is more coupling within the network and that maybe there is an adaptation towards the structural connectivity changes according to the aging process. And we further on related that to the cognitive abilities of our subjects in the empirical data again. And what we do see is that in um, subjects separated uh, in terms of their performance, in good performers and bad performers, the subjects who performed worse had a steeper, slightly at least, slightly steeper increase of this optimal, optimal network coupling parameter G um, over H. So that was quite interesting to see that maybe this is also related to the cognitive function and not just um, a modeling um, effect in our data. And now finally, it would be great uh, if we would be able to further expand our model and refine the model, because as I said in the beginning, aging is only one test case, one use case to show that it is in principle possible to relate structural and functional connectivity modeling wise and not just machine learning wise. And the next steps that we are currently working on is looking into other um, phenotypical data that are available in these large cohorts, for example, here on the left side, again, an example from the UK Biobank for aggregate cardiovascular risk. And you do see here that indeed, obviously, the white matter tracts are again affected by this cardiovascular risk, particularly here, it's the parameter uh, mean diffusivity. And on the right side, we were looking in our own cohort on uh, several other aspects. Here's one example on the physical activity effects on the white matter. And you do see here the 
examples again on these microstructure parameters like fraction anisotropy, mean diffusivity, and the higher parameters here on the right side. And you do see that there are some changes within the white matter already. And using this type of information is now the idea to further refine the models and finally would be able to, coming from the empirical data, creating a model such the as the virtual brain or another one and refining it so that we, in the end, hopefully would be able to have individualized models for a subject or in the future maybe patients to manipulate things in the model and test some effects on this modeled brain to better understand how the actual, the real brain would react. And with this, I'd like to thank you very much for your attention and apologies for the unfortunate instable connection in the meantime. Thank you so much. Thanks very much, uh, Svenja. Yeah. Uh, I think due to the internet glitch, uh, we do have to move on because of a very tight schedule this morning. But um, I hate to uh, yeah, not, not have the opportunity to open up your talk for uh, questions. Um, but, but thanks again. Um, we um, move on um, in the schedule uh, also going from a bit more from anatomy to uh, functional studies uh, with uh, Gustavo Deco. Uh, Gustavo is affiliated with the Pompeo Fabra University in Barcelona, and he is uh, quite well known and famous for uh, neural network models, whole brain dynamic studies, um, characterization of brain states, with uh, lots of tools from, from physics and uh, nonlinear dynamics. Um, so please have the floor, uh, Gustavo, and uh, welcome. Thank you, thank you, Cyril, for the kind introduction and for inviting me and giving me the, the possibility to, to, to tell you my perspective on possible neuroscience breakthrough, at least in the context of whole brain dynamics and modeling. I also thank uh, Victor for hosting this wonderful summit meeting. Uh, so um, let me start the story with, um, with a little bit of history. Uh, 15 years ago, so before starting with the, with the HPP, actually there were a group of people where we decided really to try to understand uh, the brain at the whole brain level, uh, at the global level. Uh, first, we were really focusing only on the dynamics. We renounced it to explain the computation, which is a challenge nowadays. And uh, actually, I am very happy that most of the people involved in that initiative, they are, they are here. For example, starting by our host, uh, Victor Girza, Randy McIntosh, Petra Ritter in Berlin, uh, Mikey Brixby in Australia, and I think also we were involved at the beginning. And the idea was very simple, was a little bit already sketched by Svenja. The idea is uh, cartoonized here, and as you see, our first goal was try to explain, to, to formulate a causal mechanistic uh, explanation, a model of how functional activity emerge. And the key idea, just to, 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 to keep that so simple as possible, is to fuse, to link the local uh, dynamics uh, with the anatomical information, with the coupling through the anatomy, in order to explain the emergence of functional activity. Uh, as you see um, at the beginning, was uh, very simple models, very, very, but very powerful. We were only optimizing one parameter, the G parameter that Sven already uh, uh, mentioned, which has a biophysical interpretation. We were assuming that the conductivity of all fibers, just as a matter of simplification, they are equal. So as you see, the, the models were basically extremely homogeneous. And the only way of starting to introduce some heterogeneity in order to have some diversity, for example, the diversity observed at the level of functional activity, was just by breaking the symmetry, by introducing heterogeneity at the level of white matter. And the only source of heterogeneity that we were using during many years, especially at the beginning of the project, was just the anatomy. So that in the case of humans, we were obtained through DTI information. In case of animals, uh, track tracing studies, and so on. We continue breaking the symmetry, of course, during the project at the level of white matter. And this is what we call effective connectivity, works of uh, 
Cal Friston initially, uh, also Randy was involved in that uh, approaches, and Mathieu Gilson, who is now also in Marcel. And we were uh, um, assuming that there are differences at the level of the conductivity of the different fibers, and this is what we call effective connectivity. So it's an effective connectivity masked by the anatomical information. But what I want to stress today is actually the breaking of the symmetry at the level of the gray matter. So, as I said at the beginning, as a matter of uh, simplification, we assume it as the local dynamics of all the regions were exactly the same, homogeneous. We, of course, we were aware that it's not true, but there was a, a necessary simplification at that time. And therefore, the, the challenge, uh, one of the challenges uh, that we took is, okay, it's necessary really to introduce also heterogeneity, so to break the symmetry at the level of the local uh, dynamics, so at the level of the gray matter. And there were many papers, many groups involved, trying to introduce heterogeneity at different levels. Here, uh, I mentioned just a couple of them. Uh, for example, introducing the effect of neurotransmitter, introducing the effect of different type of receptors, different type of heterogeneity, a myelin fraction, et cetera, in order to include this heterogeneity. But the challenging question is not to introduce heterogeneity in order to complicate the model per se, is to see what we get or if it's necessary and at which level is necessary to introduce as heterogeneity. Just to give you a more cartoonized flavor of what we mean, the difference is now uh, for the given parcellation, of course, not only to link the neuroanatomical information with the local brain dynamics, but, uh, and, and, and we express the local brain dynamics with your favorite type of model, could be a spiking label, dynamic mean field label, or even more abstract uh, type of models. But the key idea now is to introduce extra source of heterogeneities, and for example, we can do that, or we have done that by introducing uh, gene expressions from the Allen Institute in humans uh, in order to express the difference level of excitation inhibition balance, which is, of course, changing the level of uh, local dynamics, or introducing neurotransmitter. Here I put you just an example. In this case, we took uh, data from Gitte Knudsen, who is also here, uh, PET data, uh, which uh, expressed the density of serotonin receptors, and we were showing that uh, including that information is, of course, fundamental in order to uh, express cases where the functional activity is uh, excited uh, or inhibited by manipulating pharmacological the serotonin receptor. In this case, what you see is the label of fittings that you obtain with the heterogeneity of the serotonin receptor and the different type of serotonin receptors, and you improve the label of fittings, so the error is much better, it's lower. In cases where, for example, we were using the data from Robin Carhart Harris, where people took uh, psychedelics, which is uh, strongly linked with the uh, serotonin receptors, in this case is LSD. Second challenge uh, that I selected uh, for this talk was uh, is related. Well, if if we know how to and, and we were able to show that this level of heterogeneity is really necessary in order to include effects like neuromodulation or uh, in order to express things that we cannot uh, explain well without that level of heterogeneity. For example, ignition or properties like that. Then we were concentrated on trying to see okay we should perhaps uh, formulate the question of uh, analyzing functional activity from another point of view. So going beyond just functional connectivity or functional connectivity dynamics. And the key idea here was really to study the hierarchical, the functional hierarchical organization of the brain. So in other words, or in very simple words, uh, without going into the details, the idea is really to, to, to detect empirically in a model-free way first, who is running the show who is running the orchestration, the dynamical orchestration, and how the, the roles of this orchestration is changing under different brain states. So for example, here the, there are two ways of doing that. So you measure the information flow with your favorite uh, way of characterizing a causality. In this case, we were using an approach formulated also by Andrea Brobelli, who is also here, well, modified a little bit. It was a, a, an information theoretical uh, 
version of the Granger causality, and we apply this, for example, in this case, to human connecton projects, so over a thousand people, and the different situations and the different conditions, resting state, and seven different cognitive tasks covering the, the, the many aspects of the, of the cognitive domain. And what you see here is who is in, in each condition, in, in, in each task condition, who are the top guys, who are the, the, the director of the orchestration. And especially beautiful is when you run the intersection of that, actually it's a little bit more sophisticated that the intersection is what we call the functional bridge club. You see that there are some intersection and there are some regions which are always driving the, uh, the dynamics, independent of the cognitive task, independent of the particular underlying brain state, and we associated that, for example, with the hierarchical organization proposed by Stan De Hen and Jean-Pierre Chanchot, uh, which is what we call the global workspace. So we had a, a way of identifying in a quantitative way the, the global workspace. The problem is that, of course, in order to run this type of analysis, information flow, you have to to measure this directly in the context of fMRI because there are not so many data, it's very difficult. Here we were able to do that because we have over a thousand people and therefore it's very reliable. But in general, we don't have this condition and therefore we were looking for a, another way of extracting exactly the same type of information. And the key trick here is coming from thermodynamics. Actually, it's again cartoonized it here what you see is, and what we know from the thermodynamics, if we have a system that has a flat hierarchical organization, flat hierarchical organization means here, for example, they are absolutely democratic. So the information flow, the Granger causality, if you want, between the nodes, in, 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 the, in our case, the brain, is absolutely symmetric. So what we know is that a system like that is not producing entropy, and what is more important for us, a system like that is reversible. So if you look at the time evolution of the brain signals in a forward direction or artificially in a backward direction, uh, you cannot distinguish them. It's fully reversible. On the other hand, if you start to break the symmetry, so you start to build up a hierarchical organization without measuring directly the hierarchical organization, this will be reflected in the entropy production and will be also reflected in the label of irreversibility. So, for example, in some cases, these are not brain systems, they are physical systems. In some cases, very easy to distinguish if they, they have a, a, a non-reversibility, a non-equilibrium condition, like, for example, in this movie where you see this glass of wine uh, which is destroyed by, by a ballet. It's a, a clearly a non-reversible. When you see the movie forward or backward, you can distinguish that very easily. In other cases, you can also very easily detect that they are fully reversible system, like this colliding billiard balls. Uh, you cannot distinguish the forward and the backward movie. But in the case of the brain, it's not so easy. So, and therefore, the, the key idea is, the key question is to detect the hierarchical organization and how the hierarchical organization changed, so as before, without measuring explicitly the information flow, but characterizing that indirectly through the label of non-reversibility. And because the label of non-reversibility cannot be visualized so easily as with those movies, what we took are different approaches. For example, one is that we take the brain, our favorite signals, it could be applied to ball, EMG, EG, intracortical, local field potential, singles record, etc. You can do this at the global, at the network, or at the local level. But the basic idea is that you observe the, the, the signals as you measure them, then artificially you flip the signals and you generate the backward version, and then you try to distinguish that, in this case, for example, with the machine learning approach, we use a network, a deep learning network, and try to classify, because we know, because we generated this by hand. If we can classify properly, that means we can distinguish them, then it's, the system is highly non-reversibility, and the level of performance of this type of uh, deep learning machine is telling us something about the underlying hierarchical organization. If we cannot classify properly, then the hierarchical organization is very democratic, it's very flat. Just to give you a flavor of the, the results that we were able to obtain, again, here are ACP results of a thousand people, many different conditions, actually also with different scanners, three Tesla or seven Tesla, resting state conditions, 
when you look at the task condition, I just put it all together, all the seven different tasks, you see that the level of non-reversibility, the level of non-equilibrium increase, meaning that they are more hierarchical, which makes absolutely sense, because when you need to compute something, you need to break the detail balance, you need to, to, com to, to break the, the, the level of symmetry in the information flow, because now you have to compute something compared to racing set where you are not computing nothing specifically. So a nice result. A very astonishing result is when you contrast this with uh, the condition of watching a movie, the level of reversibility is going down, meaning that uh, watching a movie is probably so relaxing because <laughs> the hierarchical organization is really flatter. In fact, I mean, then, and that's uh, linking that with the model, we decided to, to model this uh, again to uh, offer a, a, a mechanistic explanation of the arrow of time, a mechanistic explanation of the hierarchical organization. So going much more beyond functional connectivity and functional connectivity dynamics. And in fact, for example, if you take the, the so inferred uh, underlying effective connectivity, we were able to show that, for example, you can distinguish much better the condition as compared with the functional connectivity. Of course, by definition. So if we take into account the, the hierarchy, the classification level using support vector machine in this case, and here we are contrasting two different type of movies, Hollywood movies or creative common movies. As you see at the level of the functional connectivity is chance level, but at the level of the classification based on the model explaining the hierarchical organization is much better. It's, it's extremely good. It's over 90% accuracy. Of course, you can use this technology for translational application. We apply that in many contexts. I just selected here my favorite, using the data from, uh, from Liege and from Paris, from Jacosit, uh, which are coma patients, and we were able to distinguish a different type of coma patients, minimal consciousness, uh, recover or, or, or deep coma, and in a much better way than uh, compared with the functional connectivity. I just want to finish, uh, I, I will not go into the detail, just as a matter of time, but it's uh, an important aspect and it's uh, strongly linked with the, the two first aspects that I was explaining today. I mean, one of the characteristics of this non-reversible system, of hierarchical system, is that they are a non-equilibrium, they produce entropy, uh, and they are typically associated with very particular dynamical regimes. And the, we discover that uh, that particular dynamical regime is a turbulent regime. So we decided to use tools from uh, turbulence theory, which is traditionally applied to fluid dynamics. And of course, uh, in, in the brain we have activity, uh, electrical activity, we don't have a fluid. But we were uh, able to show that, in fact, I mean, again, using different data sets, for example, here, uh, again, the, the HCP, that we have a really a turbulent, a very particular type of, of spatiotemporal chaos. In this case, what you see uh, is the label of local synchronization. And what you have to, to the take home message is that the local synchronization that we see under resting state condition in this case is really varying in a very uh, rapid way across a space, so different colors in different regions, and across time, the movie is changing the color. And this is what Kuramoto uh, called a turbulence in a non-fluid system. And we were able that using this type of technology, it's of course uh, providing some very beautiful explanation of how information is transmitted across a space and time uh, in a very efficient way, like in the case of turbulence in fluid. And uh, again, that we can use that for as a biomarker for classifying different brain states, like sleep, awake, or again, translational application. Or here is a very interesting thing also that we were doing together with Gitte Knudsen. Uh, we were uh, showing that the level of turbulence is not only changing with the, with the state of the patient, there are depressive patients taking pharmacology, SRI, but the, it's even able to predict the effect of the SRI. So different level of turbulence can correlate with the, with the outcome of the effect of that uh, uh, pharmacological treatment. Well, I think that's the, in, I try to reproduce in this, uh, in a criminal way in these 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> the, the advances. <laughs> Thank you.
Uh, thank you, Gustavo. Um, <coughs> we see these red numbers flashing, so I'm afraid we have to move on. But thanks a lot. I uh, had a couple of questions myself, but uh, please ask them uh, to Gustavo in the break or after this. <coughs> uh, to move on to uh, our next speaker, uh, we're now um, even more moving into the functional domain. Uh, Wim van Duffel um, uh, at the uh, Leuven Brain Institute in Belgium has achieved um, excellence in primate physiology, especially um, studying vision, attention, perceptual learning. So these are the kind of functions that we'll see. Um, so please have the floor, uh, Wim. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Cyril, for this very nice uh, introduction. Um, all right. So I would like to talk about uh, learning without being aware that you uh, learn. And I like to start, first one, ah, the left one, to acknowledge actually the people that do the work. Uh, I don't do the work, people do the work. And uh, there were brilliant students in my lab, Sjurt uh, Murrus, uh, Jerome Harpers, and uh, my colleague Ruffin Vogels, and above all, uh, John Arsenal, uh, who basically has driven the work that I will present today very much. Unfortunately, he left science. Um, and as you can see, he likes definitely not only science, he also likes this. And I recently discovered that this person that everybody knows here, who knows a lot about retirement plans, retirement ages, also knows a lot about sausages and also beers. And he's an expert in beers. I thought he was an expert in wines, but also in beers. We can all become experts in distinguishing beers if we train if we practice enough, and I'm pretty sure some of the youngsters have been practicing a lot yesterday night, uh, they become experts. And if you do it over and over again, after a while, you will be able to distinguish seemingly very, very similar stimuli. This is what is called perceptual learning. Yeah? And you can do it also in a way that you even don't, that you're not aware that you're learning, yeah? that you learn without knowing that you learn. And that's expe exactly what I'm gonna talk about. Uh, uh, today. So we know that practice leads to behavioral improvements, known as perceptual learning, and it changes neural representations. We know that neurons coding for these stimuli that you're learning are changing in several places in the brain. We know that from electrophysiology, fMRI, and so on and so on. What is not known, and there now I'm stealing from Gustavo, what is it that is orchestrating these changes? What is causing these changes? And that's where we don't have not a lot of uh, uh, knowledge these days. We know that attending to these stimuli, when you're drinking these beers, you have to attend to the gustatory aspects of it and so on and so on. That's very important. But we also know that there are these counterexamples, task irrelevant perceptual learning, where that's not the case, where attention does not play a major role. And there are several accounts which pointed toward rewards, that rewarding, the rewarding effect of drinking this beer, for example, or doing a task where you uh, practice many, many, many times with the same stimuli, that that plays a role. And of course, when you think about rewards, you immediately think about dopamine. And when you think about dopamine, one of the interesting areas to look at is the ventral tegmental area really deep into the brain. And that's exactly what we were we were investigating in this series of studies, what if you stimulate this ventral tegmental area in a primate, uh, 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 can it basically induce functional plasticity, the changes, the neuronal changes that uh, I just mentioned, measured with fMRI in first instance, can it also change behavioral uh, uh, aspects, can it change perception, and uh, can it change again neuronal aspects of uh, this game, but now at neuronal level, not at fMRI level at the end of the day, we don't know much what you're measuring when you're measuring fMRI signals, basically. And the big thing, and this is why I'm here, in the absence of attention, so the animals, these are non-human primates, are not aware that they are doing these things. And how are we doing this? Well, we train monkeys to fixate to a, a particular fixation point uh, here, and then they covertly, without looking at it, have to do a very difficult task. And that's the task of interest for the monkey, but not uh, uh, for us. And they do this, and we, we basically they have to make a color judgment, red, 
press left button, uh, blue, uh, press right button, and you make these differences very, very small, so that's very, very difficult for the animal. So basically, he has to allocate all his resources to this uh, discrimination uh, task. We call it the orthogonal task, throwing away attention. Then, um, so this is sort of, sort of less like the, the, the calls that we're using, and you see they are not very, very different. So it's very, very, very difficult to do this uh, task. So they are uh, below 80% correct performance levels. And then we present stimuli of our interest somewhere else. And here is a very high contrast rating, but in essence, we use very, very weak, uh, uh, low salient stimuli in these kind of uh, experiments. And the whole trick here is that at some point, we read out, we read out what's happening with fMRI, we plug in uh, monkeys in a scanner exactly as uh, most of you put human uh, subjects in scanners, and then we measure signals, uh, and we can sort of like compare conditions. We can compare conditions uh, across uh, uh, time. And the basic idea is that we look at the representations at fMRI level of a stimulus of our interest, not of interest of the monkey, because he basically his rewards are not determined by that stimulus, it's only determined by solving this color task. Yeah? So we can measure which voxels are activated, and then we take the monkey outside the scanner, and we have multiple sessions where we pair one of these stimuli, weak stimuli, with stimulation of this dopaminergic ventral pigmental area. Yeah? You do that many times, and of course we also show control stimuli where there is no pairing, and so forth, and so forth. And then again, we do the same thing as here in the beginning. We scan the monkeys again, so it's exactly the same situation here. The only difference is that in between something happened. So we push that button basically for a particular stimulus. And then the interesting game is, of course, does the representation of this stimulus change compared to this situation? Yeah? And of course, again, with control stimuli, where you control for presentations and so forth and so forth. I don't have time to go into the details. The simulation is done with uh, chronically implanted uh, micro uh, uh, electrodes. So this is how it really looks like. A monkey is fixating here. This is that color spot that he has to covertly attend to and say, okay, it's, it's red, blue, red, blue, red, blue. And then you see this very faint stimulus here. That's the stimulus that we are interested in, or the representation of that. That's what we are interested in. Okay. So. We do fMRI, and to make a long story short, uh, we compare activity between this stage of the experiment and this stage in, of the experiment with in between these stimulations, these pairing of ventral tegmental area stimulations with a particular stimulus, in this case, an oriented uh, rating. And when you do that, of course, I go back. When you do that, when the stimulus uh, is in a controlled visible field, the result is that you don't get anything. Not surprising, you know, it's basically you're measuring twice the same thing, you don't see anything different. However, in the what we call the trained visible field, basically where the stimulus was paired with a VTA stimulation, we started to see surprising actually quite profound changes at fMRI level. So at fMRI level, and we did that not only with gratings, we did it with moving patterns, we did it with faces, with the body, so quite robust kind of finding, basically, that you can induce plasticity at the level of fMRI uh, using this paired stimulation of the dopaminergic ventral pigmental uh, system. But, well, and basically what, what is happening, to, to uh, summarize it, the representation of the paired stimulus basically increases, and it comes at the cost of the unpaired stimulus. I didn't show data of the unpaired stimulus, but basically that representation reduces at fMRI uh, level. But, are there behavioral consequences? or there perceptual consequences of this manipulation? So to test that, we did more or less the same thing. So I don't have to repeat everything. The only thing that is very different here is that we use different stimuli. We use random dot stimuli that were moving randomly. When they're purely randomly moving, there is no direction of motion information available. Once a fraction of the dots start to move in a particular direction, Humans, but also monkeys, start to perceive direction of motion. And you can do psychophysics, and you can, you can basically measure how well you do that. By increasing the fraction of, of dots moving in the direction, the easier it is and the, uh, the more correct answers subjects uh, make. So we did that. We did that with stimuli 
both in the left and in the right, moving up and moving down. Yeah? And we measure, basically, psychometric functions. Then we do the same thing as at, at what I said with the gratings. We uh, the, ask the monkey to do the orthogonal uh, color uh, task, so detracting attention from these moving uh, uh, patterns, basically. And we paired one of them, for example, upward motion uh, on the left-hand side with stimulation of the ventral tegmental area. So basically exactly the same game as the fMRI experiment. And then again, after a number of sessions, we uh, did exactly the same here. So basically, same paradigm. How does perception change between this condition and this condition with the only difference here in between that we press the button at some point? Yeah? We press the VTA button uh, uh, several uh, times. Um, so during that pressing, very important, the monkey is not attending. He is not aware of what is being learned. Very, very uh, uh, crucial in this uh, uh, experiment because otherwise you could say this is an attention effect. We wanted to avoid that this would be a selective attention effect to the stimulus, the stimulus of our interest. All right, so this is how it looks like. Uh, you see here the fixation point, again the color spot, and then we had two stimuli, 0% coherence, so there's random motion on the left and the right, and then at some point, the uh, one of the stimuli became 2% coherent mo uh, uh, moving dots, which is very, very low. You don't see it. Well, I don't see it. Maybe some of you see it, but I, I doubt it. So it's a little bit of motion information that is uh, introduced, and that was paired with VTA stimulation, and the monkey does the color test. This is how it looks in reality. Tell me if you see the motion. You know, one of them became 2% motion coherence. I don't think anybody sees it. Okay, the projector might be not as good. The monkey is fixating here, and that's that color thing, and I don't think anybody sees it. So we just stimulate for one of the stimuli, basically forward, uh, for example, upward motion, 2% coherent uh, uh, dots. Uh, when you do that, oops, I have to go out. Uh, so again, same as what I said before, we compare behavior, psychophysics, after uh, versus prior the stimulation block, the VTA stimulation block. And basically, this is the, the, the summary of that experiment. Indeed, for two animals in this case, 100% uh, sure the monkey was not aware that this stimulus was paired with VTA stimulation. Very surprising. This was very surprising to me, basically. Both animals, for both animals, the sensitivity for this stimulus increases. So the D prime for these stimuli uh, increased at the cost of the stimulus that was not paired. So you do have an effect on, st on stimuli that were not paired with uh, VTA stimulation. So indeed, we not only changed at fMRI level plasticity, or we induce plasticity at cortical uh, uh, level, we also change perception of these animals in a very subtle way. Yeah? So the animals are not aware of that. Um, and again, we did that for multiple stimuli. I don't have time to go into detail because Cyril will kill me. Um, we also did it with faces and bodies and, and with very, very stringent attention, uh, additional attention controls to make sure that the monkeys were not attending to the stimulus of our interest, basically. Finally, fMRI is just fMRI, is hemodynamic signal what happens at single unit uh, level. So we started to uh, stick in electrodes, basically, in uh, some of these patches that showed up in the fMRI experiment to, to reduce the needle in haystack problem. And uh, just one slide, and then I'm within my time. Uh, basically, what you're seeing here is the population response of all neurons recorded in this posterior infratemporal uh, area. And blue is for control stimuli. That's sort of like the distribution, basically, of orientation selectivity when nothing happens. That's sort of like all orientations are more or less equally uh, uh, present in that area. There is not much of a bias. This is the orientation basically where we paired VTA stimuli. So a dramatic change actually, much stronger than with typical real perceptual learning effects. We induced at neural, at single cell level basically, this dramatic uh, change in uh, orientation uh, uh, pr uh, tuning properties in that particular uh, area. 
The last thing that I want to say is, is this is done with many, many stimulations, so we really pressed that button many times. And that last study basically we showed that you can induce these effects at single cell level very, very quickly within 10, 20, 30 trials, basically. All right, uh, so I think I can conclude. Uh, VTA stimulation, ventral tegmental area stimulation, causes in, man in monkeys plasticity uh, uh, of cortical representations, both measured with fMRI and single units. It enhances representations of a cue paired with stimulation. It changes perceptual abilities, basically improves discrimination of the feature paired with stimulation in the absence of attention. So we have perceptual learning here without the monkey, the subject being aware that it is learning. So if you push that button, of course, in a, monk, in, in a human, this would be exceedingly difficult to do. We do have electrodes sitting there. If you push that button, you can train without being uh, consciously aware that you're uh, training. The final thing, uh, this is outside the context of this work package, but in another work package, we, for the people that are working in primates, we developed, and um, Nicola might be around, Nicola, and uh, also Rembrandt uh, were uh, here. Uh, we have been spending quite a lot of time on developing a new, very, very good uh, uh, monkey template atlas that is now available uh, for use, uh, and that is competitive, definitely, uh, compared to existing atlases. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks, Wim. <clears throat> yeah. Um, again, please address Wim uh, in the break or uh, later on during the day. Uh, thanks very much for uh, a very interesting talk. <clears throat> um, we then have as next speaker uh, Umberto Olcese. Uh, like me, he works at the University of Amsterdam and represents a bit more the up-and-coming excellent researchers. Uh, Umberto also joined the partnering program of HPP and um, is uh, well known for his work in multisensory integration uh, in, in rodents, visual perception, and also applying optogenetic techniques. Please have the floor. Uh, thank you. Thanks, uh, Cyril. Uh, first of all, I'd like to yeah, thank Cyril for the invitation and the organizers of this meeting. Um, the starting point of my talk is the principle, so called principle of functional segregation, according to which each brain area mainly does one function. So, for example, in the context of sensory motor transformation, we first have auditory and visual areas that process, respectively, audition and vision. They send their outputs to association areas, which integrate this information, and send it further to frontal motor areas for decision making and motor preparations. Now, of course, there are also feedback and lateral connections, and these are mainly thought to play a moderatory role. Well, we wanted to test this principle. And to do so, we focus on the mouse primary visual cortex, which is typically thought to process visual stimuli and set it further on. And we ask two questions. For the first, is the mouse V1 also somehow directly involved in perceptual decision making besides visual processing? And second, is mouse V1 also processing auditory stimuli? Uh, to address these questions, we perform experiments in Headfix mice. This was a collaboration with real panels, and the experiments were primarily done by Matthijs Alder Hohaus, a former PhD student in their lab. So mice were head fixed, and they had to solve an audiovisual change detection task. So they were faced with a constant stream of visual stimuli, a grating, and a constant stream of auditory information, some sounds, that sometimes randomly change in other orientation, and that was a visual change or pitch, an auditory change. We then add three cohorts of mice. First, naive mice, or no contingently exposed mice. These were just passively observing sensory information. We then add unisensory trained mice that had to detect visual changes by licking, for example, left and get some reward. And multisensory trained mice, they had to lick left upon a visual change and right upon an auditory change. And all these cohorts got the very same sensory stimuli, but had to use information differently. Now, these are adfix mice. This is an example of a setup. We recorded brain activity using, in this case, two laminar silicon probes, and we had an optic fiber for optogenetic modulation. Um, we found that task contingencies, so what animals were doing with the sensory information, drastically changed the kind of activity we could see in V1. In naive mice, 
we could see that the visual stimulus, visual change, elicited a short latency, short lasting wave of activity. However, in trained mice, both uni and multisensory trained mice, upon detection of visual stimulus, so in HIT trials, we also saw a secondary later wave, which was report related and preceded responses. Um, we went a bit further just looking activity of single neurons, we tried to use a single neuron decoding approach to quantify what was the fraction of neurons in V1 which coded different task relevant information. So for instance, we found no difference between the three cohorts for what pertains in coding orientation of visual stimuli or the occurrence of a change in the orientation. However, we saw differences for what pertains in coding of report related information in V1. This was only present in trained mice even if naive mice sometimes just leaked upon a visual stimulus, just randomly. And there was a difference between the two cohorts. In, in multisensory trained mice, this report-related activity appeared later compared to unisensory trained mice. And in fact, the onset of this report-related activity is tightly correlated with reaction time and precedes reaction time. So we wonder whether this activity in V1 might play any functional role, and we exploited the fact that the onset of the report related activity was separated between the two cohorts, was temporarily separated. It started earlier than 200 milliseconds after stimulus onset in unisensory trained mice, and later than this 200 millisecond cutoff in multisensory trained mice. So what we did, we inactivated V1 bilaterally using optogenetics either at stimulus onset, so early in activation, or at 200 milliseconds after stimulus onset, late in activation. What we saw is that early in activation similarly impaired visual detection, partially impaired visual detection, threshold and max are two levels of saliency, the stimuli are the same, this was a difficult task, this was a more an easier task. However, late in activation had a different effect. It only partially impaired detection in multisensory trained mice, so only if this wave or report related activity had not yet begun in V1. And in fact, this strength of the impairment correlated with reaction time. The longer mice took the response, the later this wave of report related activity, the stronger the effect of inactivation. So this suggests that mm, the way in which mm, V1 processes stimuli depends on how the information is being used in the context of decision making. So task demands in particular delay the uh, arrival, the start in V1 of this late component of report related activity, and until the moment in which this wave starts, V1 is necessary for decision making. So this window in which V1 is used and is involved in decision making extends with task complexity, not, at least, in our case, we didn't test, we not with stimulus complexity. Now, in our um, task, we also add auditory stimuli, and we wonder whether we could see any trace of auditory process in V1. In fact, we saw that uh, upon an auditory stimulus, in V1, we could see auditory-related responses in all cohorts, and these were mainly more stronger, much, sorry, stronger in multisensory trained mice. Uh, the single neural level, these auditory related responses were mostly orthogonal. For instance, you can see this here in multisensory trained mice with some neurons responding to visual stimuli in blue and other neurons responding to auditory stimuli in red. And not only were these V1 neuron responses to sounds in general, they were actually differentiating between different sounds. So for instance, these are two example neurons which show different responses to different uh, sound frequencies here in red and in orange. So this suggests there may be some frequencies encoding, frequency tuning in mouse V1. However, uh, recent studies show that mouse V1 also responds to spontaneous motions um, in terms of corollary discharges. And what we saw is that uh, this, when we played sensory stimuli, in particular when we played sound, mice uh, showed some strong orofacial motions here quantified in terms of motion energy. Not only they, the mice move their faces upon auditory stimuli, but they move their faces differently based on which auditory stimulus was played. And in fact, what we found was that there was a tight correlation between our ability to discriminate which sound was being played by looking at the orofacial movement 
And the responses that we found in V1, so the frequency selectivity of V1 neurons was tightly correlated with the frequency selectivity that could be observed in the video recording. And this was not present for what pertains orientation selectivity. So this was only true for auditory references. So this somehow might suggest that, uh, or well, this leads to a question, are these auditory related responses caused by auditory uh, inputs to V1, or are they as a consequence of motor reactions to the auditory stimuli? Well, this second hypothesis was actually recently supported by a study by the Carandini Harris lab, which um, proposed most auditory related information that was previously found in V1 was actually of a motor origin. However, we also noticed that these auditory related responses in V1 were very fast. They had an onset of 27 milliseconds for a stimulus onset, slightly later than auditory cortex, and faster than visually evoked responses in V1, which we hypothesize is not in line with the motor origin, it's too fast. So in fact, when we ran a generalized signal model on the activity of signal neurons, we found that in mouse V1, uh, auditory regressor explained a significant portion of the variance that could be in the final rate. So lower than what can be explained in terms of visual and motor regressors, but still significant. Of course, this for comparison what we could see in auditory cortex. Moreover, when we decomposed the activity in V1 in auditory, motor, and visual related, we found that the auditory component was faster, at the faster latency compared to motor uh, components, suggesting that at least an early component of this auditory-related activity in V1 does have an auditory origin. So to causally test this, we inactivated the auditory cortex, which is the main source of auditory signals to V1. We did so by bilateral muscular injections. Visual detection was not affected, while auditory detection was partially impaired. In terms of neural responses, visual responses were not affected by muscular injection, but auditory responses were. In particular, they were delayed. So suggesting that the initial auditory component was suppressed, while the later motor-related component uh, was still present. And this was confirmed with the GLM approach, in which they explained the variance explained by auditory aggressors dropped following muscular injection. So to summarize, um, our study support a view that visual cortex is not purely a processing stage for visual stimuli, which then sends information further on. It is somehow involved in decision making, but how exactly and to what extent this might be a causal involvement uh, is to be determined. And second, it also processes auditory signals, but the function of these auditory signals in V1 is still to be investigated. And we're currently working with follow-up studies to address this. Um, just to conclude, uh, the data as, that were collected has been already partially uploaded or is being uploaded on eBrains that will allow reuse and it's already enabling some modeling study to be performed on this data, for instance, by the group of Walter Sam. And we also think that this exchange of information between areas is quite interesting in the context of understanding how the brain generates consciousness and in other in follow-up studies we are indeed doing this. In another serial collaborations, we test contrasting predictions of different theories of consciousness. And finally, I'd like to thank all the collaborators and lab members, in particular Matthias Rio, and all the funding sources. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> Many thanks, uh, Umberto. <clears throat> uh, in view of time, we move on, but. Uh, Please um, uh, ask questions uh, later to Umberto also. So we move on to our last speaker. Uh, Claire Saint-Jean is, um, let's say, official non-HBP guest speaker. Uh, we're very pleased to welcome here, thus. Um, she works at the Université Paris-Cité and CNRS. Um, she's uh, very well known in the field of consciousness, and um, it's a pleasure to, uh, uh, to welcome you on stage and hear more about um, uh, studies that also involve bifurcation analyses and um, mm. report versus no report uh, paradigms. Please have the floor, uh, Claire. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you very much, uh, Thierry, for the invitation. I'm, I'm very glad and honored to be part of this event. 
Um, so today I'm going to show you an overview of uh, what I think we know now about the neural correlates of, uh, of conscious processing and, uh, and give you an idea of um, a project that we just started to get to the next step and really get at the signatures, uh, the neural signatures of uh, conscious processing. So let me first uh, acknowledge uh, all my uh, students and collaborators. Uh, obviously, all the work that I'm going to show is uh, collaborative work. So uh, here are the merry faces I, I'm, uh, I'm uh, lucky to work with every, every day. So first, uh, what is conscious processing? Well, let's just start with a, a, a little demo. Um, there will be a, a little um, green dot that will be fl flickering uh, at the center of the screen. I just want you to fixate this green dot and look at what ha what's happening in your conscious experience. So normally, if you're not asleep, uh, at some point, you will see one or several of the yellow dots around disappear. Um, I swear they don't disappear from the screen. They only disappear from your conscious experience. So they are always there on the screen. They are always there on your retina. So they are uh, always processed by your brain to some extent. Uh, but sometimes you have conscious access to this information. Uh, you can report it, you can acknowledge that it's there, and sometimes it's not, okay? Uh, so the question becomes very simple. What's the difference in my brain when I process the same information unconsciously versus when I process it and I have conscious access to it? And Basically, that sums up uh, a very successful approach that has been uh, put forth in the last 50 years to study the neural correlates of conscious processing. So what do we know from this approach? What are the neural correlates of conscious processing when we do, do this subtraction? Well, many uh, studies, including mine, found that the difference is essentially uh, uh, essentially lies in the late phases of stimulus processing where uh, information is shared across higher level areas and sensory areas. Okay, fine, but there are other studies uh, that show earlier differences uh, within the, the stages where there are sensory processing going on around 100 milliseconds after the presentation of the stimulus. And yet other uh, experiments using other types of paradigms have found even earlier differences, D differences in brain activity uh, between seeing uh, consciously versus not seeing consciously even before the stimulus, okay? So uh, that's not uh, science fiction, it's just that maybe some uh, variations in the brain activity before the stimulus will predict whether you will be able to see that stimulus uh, uh, when it comes versus not, okay? So that means that uh, I think we're at a turning point in this research. This research has been very successful because we've seen that indeed it makes an enormous difference in your brain when you become conscious of a stimulus versus not, although the stimulus is always the same, okay? But now we have to move forth and among all these things that correlate with conscious processing, we need to identify core mechanisms of conscious access and distinguish them from other things that correlate with conscious uh, processing but are not part of the mechanisms proper. So precursor things like sensory processes that will favor or disfavor your becoming conscious of the stimulus and also consequences of uh, conscious processing, such as executive processes uh, that we usually confound 
with conscious processing in these experiments because we ask people to make a task on the stimulus. We ask them, did you see the stimulus? Okay, so can we make this dissection and really get at the core mechanisms of conscious access? Well, this is um, the objective of uh, this new project uh, for which I received a, a recently a, a con ERC consolidator grant, and we just started that uh, in, uh, in January. And uh, here we're going to try and do this dissection by relying on two new experimental approaches that uh, my team and I have developed recently. And uh, this project will include this experimental approach uh, with a modeling approach. And our objective, a bit ambitious, is, is at the end to be able to get at uh, operational signatures of uh, conscious processing. Being able to read out from brain activity whether someone is conscious of the representation that is there or not. And that might be interesting also for diagnosing consciousness in uh, non-communicating patients. So here, I'm just going to give you a glimpse of one of the two functional, uh, uh, sorry, one of the two experimental approaches that we're going to use uh, to try and tackle this question, how can we decouple conscious access from task-related processes? Um, the way we want to tackle uh, this question is by asking, are there some brain activations that split between conscious and non-conscious processing, even in the absence of a task? Uh, and when I say splitting between conscious and non-conscious processing, I'm referring to uh, what uh, Serial called uh, bifurcation dynamics. The same stimulation, the same input can have drastically different consequences in, uh, in brain activity. And that also relates, I guess, to uh, uh, some of what uh, Gustavo Deco uh, told about uh, uh, in his presentation. So special dynamics of the brain. Um, so can, can we find some brain activations that do this split? And does it match between becoming conscious of the stimulus or not? Um, to uh, test this, we use a very simple protocol uh, with humans uh, in which we, we varied uh, the, the intensity of a sound, a, a French vowel played uh, in headphones, uh, from, very, uh, from inaudible uh, levels to clearly audible levels. And we were looking for uh, brain activities that would show this kind of dynamics that would, uh, across trials, uh, show low activity uh, grouped around uh, a baseline activity when the stimulus is inaudible. When the stimulus is clearly audible, uh, this brain activity would be uh, much higher up with, with all the trials grouped around this high mean. But interestingly, we predict that some uh, brain activity, when you present vowels at, uh, at, the, threshold of, uh, at the auditory threshold, we should, will show a split between two types of trials. For exactly the same stimulation on some trials, activity will be low uh, at the level of baseline, and on some other trials, it will be higher up so that we have a split between two types of trials. And we would expect this across different uh, intensity levels so that we could, just based on uh, the analysis of trial by trial activity, uh, identify two types of trials that might correspond to two types of uh, conscious experience. So, how, so that's just the model. That's what we're looking for. So how can we uh, um, identify that in brain activity? Well, if we do the, the, the usual uh, uh, data processing by averaging activity across trials, it's not very diagnostic of this type of uh, dynamics. But we can do another very simple summary statistics. We can look at the 
variability of activity across trials as a function of stimulation uh, strength. And here, we predict a very typical pattern where we have a peak of variability across trials uh, for uh, stimu intermediate stimulation, because these are stimulations where there's a split between two types of trials, a bifurcation. So as a first approximation, we can use that as a signature of our special bifurcation dynamics. So now let's look at whether we have these bifurcation dynamics at some point in the processing of our stimulus. So first, in, um, in sessions, standard sessions where people have to report the stimulus, uh, active listening. Uh, and here are the EG, uh, here is the uh, uh, event-related activity we recorded on the, our participant with early, um, early sensory activity and later higher level activity. And what we observed is that this signature of bifurcation dynamics was absent during the first uh, sensory processing of the stimulus, and it was very clearly present during the last uh, um, uh, part of uh, stimulus processing, suggesting that this last activity splits uh, across trials uh, when the stimulus is at threshold. Sometimes it's triggered, sometimes it's not. Does it match with uh, a conscious experience? Well, we can... Uh, uh, model or trial by trial activity, look at this split and see whether when this uh, late activity is triggered, we can predict whether people are going to say that they have heard the stimulus. And uh, so predicting conscious report only based on neural activity. And indeed, we can do that very well. So now the next question is what happens when we're not doing a task on the stimulus? Maybe this last activity is only related to doing a task on the stimulus. Well, what we observe is really interesting because we still observe late activity on those trials, but uh, the, it's, it's a different waveform, so probably a different network at, that is at play, but it's still late sustained activity. And more interestingly, this late sustained activity shows this marker of bifurcation dynamics. So it means that this late sustained activity at some point in uh, uh, stimulation intensity will show split bifurcation dynamics. Sometimes it's triggered, sometimes it's not. So the last question is, when it's triggered, does it mean that you are, you are spontaneously aware of the stimulus? How can we assess that? In these experiments, passive listening, people didn't have a task to do on the stimulus. But from time to time, at the end uh, of the trial, we asked them, what's in your mind? So we thought, uh, can we predict by the presence of this late activity, whether on that trial, when by surprise I asked the, uh, uh, the guy, uh, what's in your mind? Uh, then the person responds, oh, I was thinking of the sound versus anything else. Can we predict that? Can we predict spontaneous conscious access uh, based on this uh, brain activity? And the answer is yes. We could make this prediction of spontaneous conscious access. So uh, can we have precisions about what this uh, late uh, activity related to spontaneous conscious access looks like? Well, we can start and um, reconstruct uh, the neural sources of this late activity. So first, in the active sessions where people are doing a task on the stimulus, uh, this late activity is very well known. Uh, it corresponds to a, a full network of areas, including auditory areas, but also uh, uh, parietal temporal areas. It corresponds to uh, what Gustavo Deco uh, uh, already uh, called uh, the global workspace uh, in one of the uh, most prominent uh, theories of uh, consciousness uh, nowadays. So what does this network look like when people are not doing a task on the stimulus? Well, 
it's still a network, still including auditory uh, activity, uh, frontal and parietal, but a little bit different. And what's interesting is that the difference is very focal and it makes a lot of sense. The difference is in the executive system, okay? So uh, maybe what we have that now is a framework where when people are doing a task on the simulus, uh, the network that is related to uh, consciously processing this information might be what we call a global workspace where the sensory information is communicated to higher level uh, activity in uh, the direction of a task. But when we're listening passively, maybe what we have is a global playground where the sensory information might still be maintained and shared within a wide network of areas, but for no particular purpose. And the transition between the two might be the articulation with task-related networks. So that's really the framework that we want to investigate in this, uh, in this uh, project. And obviously, it, it could be a very promising tool to probe consciousness in the absence of report. We have now a principle that can guide us into finding uh, brain activity that might relate to conscious experience without asking the, uh, the person what's their conscious experience. Uh, and it might be of interest in particular in diagnosing uh, consciousness in non-communicating patients in association with already developed um, tools. So I thank you for your attention and I hope I was not too long. <laughs>